welcome to the Tumbleweed Podcast, where we discuss an eclectic range of topics, including business, design, Texas culture, and everything in between. We're two teachers that turned a side hustle into a nationally known apparel brand, and now we work with some of the biggest names in Texas. We strive to never stop exploring and continue to draw inspiration from our adventures. So drift and explore or raise a glass. We're always ready to hang out and talk about the things that we love. So come roll with us as we drift and explore. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Tumbleweed Podcast. Um, I'm your host, Jeb Matalich, and we've got Brian Weissong alongside me. And we've got a special guest today, uh, Mark Sanders from 321 Media. What's up, Mark? How are you guys doing? <laughs> I think it's the first time I've ever heard you pronounce your last name, so I'm glad to know that. Hey, it's Matalich, M-A-T-U-L-I-C-H. I've been saying it wrong for years. Yeah, well, you wouldn't be the first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, we brought Mark on today. We are going to talk about music. I mean, this is going to be like a very music-intensive um, podcast. We're going to go and do the ins and outs. We're going to let him tell us a little bit about kind of his job in the music industry uh, I think there's going to be a lot of things that we kind of uncover that that may be eye opening or just maybe interesting to the the normal person that that's just curious about music and especially kind of the Americana or the Texas music scene, uh, the Red Dirt scene. Uh, Mark is the man who knows a lot about that, and so we're going to jump in and kind of ask him some questions and stuff and see kind of how uh, he responds and maybe we'll learn a few things today. Yeah, excited. We'll f- we'll find out how much I know here pretty shortly. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> well. Uh, so, uh, you know, for everyone to know, um, you know, our friendship goes beyond, obviously, this podcast, and we've known you for a while. Um, and, you know, if you don't mind sharing, what exactly is it that you do? Tell them about your business, kind of who you are and what you do. So um, I was in radio for, for many years, um, working in Austin and Dallas, different markets and different stations. Um, Started off with local, and then I moved into a national sales role, which essentially became very transactional. A lot of inventory, pricing management, things like that, efficiencies. And um, the industry itself, um, especially on the high-end corporate side, started to kind of um, shrink a little bit. Um, And the company I was at had um, kind of set itself up for an acquisition. And with that, obviously, comes some different measures that come into place to make something look more attractive when you're trying to move it. So... Um, I kind of saw the walls closing in a little bit. Um, so I took some of the stuff that I had had worked on over the years um, and wanted to apply that into something more of, in my level of interest. Um, so in my years in Austin, I had worked on some different music series um, with a station down there. And so we produced these things. And I mean, I was kind of on the on the ancillary involvement side, yeah. but I was really kind of hooked on it. Um, sponsorship stuff and, you know, trying to help facilitate some of the band stuff. And, and so I kind of had this interest for years, and I just love music anyway. Um, so towards the end of my, my time at this radio group in Dallas, there was a, um, a lot of call for, like when they would send in requests for rates and different you know types of packages and things, there was a, a call for a lot more in-person events. They were looking, a lot of sponsors, or I'm sorry, a lot of uh, clients wanted to sponsor events, have feet on the ground, and, I, and a lot. So I was like, yeah. this is this might be something. I wonder if I could put together um, a scenario where I work with Texas-based bands and promoters and, and try to create some sort of network to where if a large client wants to come in and do multiple shows in Texas, you know, can I put together a package where we have four or five shows in these markets and this is how many people you're going to reach and here's a bigger package for you guys just to buy all these impressions. So these are like companies that yeah. – yeah, so so I mean, if you just you know just say X company, think of a large company, right. you know, that has a large agency. Um, you know, they would they would be sending down these requests, and I handled Houston and Dallas at the time, so I had two markets, so they'd send down the same request. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, if it's good in Houston, good in Dallas, right? Maybe they're you know interested in doing multiple markets. So that's kind of where that came from. So I'd put together these. I, I started working. I took this idea to um, some of my friends in the business, um, some agents, some um, managers, some different types of people, and then some promoters that I happen to know. And I was like, hey, this is an idea that I have. Um, you know, do you guys see any value in this for you know whatever reason? And um, they all kind of had a 
it was a void that I didn't really realize existed in the yeah. fact that they, you know, a lot of these promoters, if you're not a large promoter, you know, you don't necessarily have um, like a salespeople on staff or any kind of sponsorship people. So they were like, this is great. We'll just cut you back on whatever you sell, but we don't have anyone doing this currently. Yeah. And then a lot of the bands were also interested in the fact that, you know, whenever you bring in sponsorships to a show, a lot of times these sponsorships bubble up to this top number and everybody settles after expense. So this just goes into this number where they can have more revenue that isn't yeah. tied to tickets or so a lot of my manager and, and uh, booking agent friends were like, this could help us too. Here's some promoters that we work with, maybe have some conversations cool. with these guys. And so that's kind of how the, the idea, this is before I left my company. This oh, is yeah. all conversations I was having before. Um, so I, once I kind of got like a proof of concept to some degree, I kind of went out to some of my, my, I had like clients that I'd had previously when I worked in more of the local radio yeah. and they, uh, kind of try to build a little book of business before I just kind of went out on my own. That's um, crazy. So I kind of built a little client list. Yeah, we, we have this yeah. to spend this year. We'd be interested in looking at stuff like this. So I had this little framework. Um, and then thankfully I was able to get in with the Coke FM people too um, at the same time. So I took them my idea and I was like, hey, this is what I'm working on, but I also need to make sure that I can afford my mortgage. <laughs> so <laughs> do you guys have a space for, for me to come sell with you guys and work on uh, – work in the same capacity with you while I'm doing this also. And, and fortunately they were, they saw value in what I was bringing. And so they, they brought me on there too. So I left and started that at the same time. Very cool. So that's great. I mean, it's really cool to, to hear that you kind of, you know, like a true entrepreneur kind of found a, maybe a problem or, or something that was kind of a missing link and then came up with the idea to, to get that rolling and, and make it happen. So, I mean, I know you've, you know, you've done a lot of great stuff uh, throughout Texas you know, for quite a while, some of the biggest shows that, you know, they've put on. So it's really neat. It's, a, it's amazing. So, of course, we, you don't know what you don't know, mm -hmm. and you only know it until you go through it. And right. for us with T-shirts, people don't realize all the things that go on behind the scenes. It's a lot more than just selling a T-shirt. Same thing with the music industry. And I, I hopefully we can get through some of those uh, some of those cool stories and things <laughs> for everyone to hear. But uh, getting to know you, I learned about there's so much more behind a festival than just the ban and selling tickets. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned what you do with Coke FM mm -hmm. uh, and with your current business. Uh, what are some other festivals, events that you've been a part of through uh, through the, your journey? Um, so I worked with a couple of, of promoters. And early on, um, I kind of latched on to um, – I have, I have a, a couple of good friends who are who are, are, are agents, and um, so I was able to get on pretty early with some of these bands that were still playing their own shows. Right. Um, so, like, you know, some of the biggest sponsorships that I did were on some, like, Cody Johnson runs pretty early, probably, like, in 17, 18 time frame before he really okay. – I mean, because he was playing more, like, amphitheaters and, and still, like, larger, like – local rodeo arenas yeah. and stuff like they would they would buy these out and then put on the show there so a lot of that stuff kind of came um early on like i wasn't we didn't do coke fest until 2017 so there was a there was a year and a half there where i was just doing sponsorships and honestly coke fest started out much smaller than it is now so even through that a lot of these shows with these individual artists were important um and i've done all kinds of stuff like whenever you know I would work with like the Blue Light in Lubbock. We would do street parties out there. I worked with the uh, with Jab Fest, which is a Josh Abbott band festival that's been going on for years with the with a buddy of mine named Jason. And so I just I'd kind of find opportunistic ways to I don't know find spots. And honestly, some clients would come to me and, and say, you know, I need to be in Austin or Dallas or do you have anything? And I would just find something and try to go source it and see who the promoter was and maybe he was a friendly and if he was. And so it was it started off pretty haphazard. I mean, but it was just you know grinding really. And then um, and then some of the other stuff, people would call me, and all of a sudden it was kind of like the network started to grow, and that's whenever things got better. So. Of course, on social media, you're known as 321 Media. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you're Mark by, by human. <laughs> uh, so do you do all this through 321 Media uh, and that, through your business, or, or are you doing it uh, through Coke FM? So for me, all the stuff that's not essentially directly tied to Coke, um, I kind of run through the 321 line. Um, but we do, I do work with Coke on, um, you know, Coke Fest. I do some radio stuff with them as well, some sales and different things with in, in the house there. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm an employee of Coke, so like, I mean, I work with with them, um, you know, yeah. a large portion of the time. 
Um, but we have that. And then we're actually adding um, another event this year in the fall, which we're really excited about. So we'll have Coke Fest and then a secondary one um, in November. So, yeah, we do a lot. And that's kind of, you know, it was organic the way it happened. They wanted to do a festival of some sort, and we kind of piecemealed the first one together and learned a whole lot on how to do things and what not to do. I mean, we were there were, we were such a bare bones staff that first year that, um, you know, Lise Hudson is is – a woman I've worked with for 20 years. She gave me my first job in radio. She's a awesome. long time ago. But I work with her. She and I went into Coke at the same time. It's like, I'll do it, you know, we'll, we'll do it together, you know. Um, but Lisa's, you know, Lisa's takeaway from the first Coke Fest is that we all made it out alive is kind of our, our yeah, big right. calling card there. So, um, but we learned a lot, started hiring some great staff, you know, like you guys know Chad and Bethany from Highbridge, and we brought in some infrastructure people, a great concessionaire. So we, we really learned a lot that first year how to optimize it. But, um, I digress completely. The question was, yeah. um, where, uh, what do I run it through? Yeah. So Coke, Coke is, Coke is an important part of my, of my day, um, and of my career really. Um, but 321 is kind of where all the other events, um, I run everything I can through there. But then again, I'm, I'm a hired gun in a lot of ways. So it, it ended up just becoming where kind of, I push my money and taxes through is, is that entity. Cool. But anything that I do on my own, um, I definitely put it under the 321 heading. So if you're listening, make sure you go follow 321 Media, of course. Um, but kind of coming, degressing or going back, how, and Jeb might need to speak up on this one, but how did we all get connected, one, and then two, your roots of Texas? Uh, just kind of going before you started the company, got in the music world, uh, you know, where are you from? And then how did we even get connected as Tumbleweed Textiles with you? If you want to lead with that, because... I don't remember, to be honest with you. I, I remember something about Dalton Domino having y'all stuff or something somewhere, and I was like, oh, I wonder who these guys are. That's all I really remember, but I don't exactly know how that all transpired. Yeah, I don't know either. Uh, yeah. It might have been something with one of Dalton's shows in Lubbock or something. I mean, he was kind of promoting us. We had kind of, I think, sponsored, was it Drinko or something with Dalton That's Domino? Correct. We gave okay. him some koozies, and they, they wanted to put our logo and stuff on the flyer. And it Man, if you look at that old uh, flyer, who was there? I mean, it was everybody. Like Parker McCollum was there, Co Wetzel. I mean, it was like Flatland. It was like all the big dogs now were playing at this little show that Dalton was putting on in Lubbock. But I, I want to say that you just messaged me on Twitter. Okay. I think it was like a direct message, and I kind of blew you off maybe at first because <laughs> like, who's this guy? What's three twenty one media? I had no idea how you weren't because you were because you were making it sound like you know you wanted to work with us. Like I was kind of trying to like wrap my head around like. What would a media guy be wanting from us? Like, what could we? How, what's his? What's his angle? What's his play? And I think, you know, we kind of went back and forth and kind of messaged each other before we met a few times. And then, I think maybe you maybe sat down with Brian or, or one of us and you kind of explained what you did. And we're like, oh, okay, cool. So that yeah, mm-hmm. so you're in the concert Texas music business, which, which is right down our alley. So I think that's kind of where we made that first connection. But you, we, I might even want to go back before that because. Tell everybody about you. You actually had a music career at one point. Like, so where where in Texas are you from? And then, like, what what was your initial, um, you know, step into the the music industry? Because I know you used to play a little bit. I'm Tell shaking, us about I'm that. Almost shaking that completely off. So. <laughs> well, you we can just be uh, brief about we it. We brought it back. No, it's it's honestly it's fine. It, it, it was um, it was in college really more than anything else. But it was um, I'm I'm from the Houston area, a town called Dayton, which is like okay. between Houston and Beaumont. Yeah. Um, kind of a small rice farming town is what it really like we have the that's that's kind of our at least it used to be sort of our uh our gdp piece of the world but um so grew up there and then um went to i went to school for a year at tcu um didn't do so hot kind of went you know a little frat ish (laughs) yeah um so going to a private school um you know, there's not a lot of wiggle room for not doing as hot because it's just, you know, not going to work out for you from your financial side. So um, I ended up settling down in, in San Marcos after that, and I went to school at, at Southwest Texas at the time. But yeah. um, it was really cool. I mean, it was great. I love San Marcos. I love the whole college thing. A lot of my buddies from home, my hometown were there and just kind of settled right in and enjoyed it. But um, the music stuff kind of picked up there. I wasn't really any good, you know. It was, it was, but everybody was doing it, so I just kind of jumped on with that. And that's, you know, that's where I met a lot of people that I still kind of keep in contact with. But we we all kind of ran around together and played shows. And I guess the biggest thing that um, I did was like, and I consider it. I mean, and he knows it. He'll, he'll you know. But it, it's it's. I, I went on the road with Randy Rogers. I was his like 
tour manager for like it used to be when that record came out. Tour manager is very loose. Yeah. But because we, we're all just not really, we're right. all it was, figuring it out. All, yeah. It, was, it wasn't what, it's, what it looks like now. Um, but Randy was breaking a little bit and he had this record coming out and I just, you know, I, I wanted to help and and honestly you know i needed a job of some sort i was delivering pizzas and this was better um but he would let me like i would go on the road with him and he would let me essentially open shows acoustic so i would go and i would get to open the show and then i'd run to the back and very merch cool for the that's show so awesome so yeah it's kind of like that's but honestly that time and i we played a lot of shows and i still am really good friends with several of the people that i played with so it, it and we all have normal jobs now but like it was um a really good like internship to some degree to understand how the industry worked from the backside, like to learn how to book shows and to learn how to try to market your shows. And back then there was no social media. This is how old I am. There's no social media. So it's like, you had to like put posters up and stuff. It was like, this is my space was like barely even <laughs> a thing. It was like, not really. Yeah. Um, and there was no streaming services. There was all was still like Napster type thing. So it was just in different time, but it was great because I learned a lot. And honestly, that's how I got into an internship at a radio station is through playing shows. And one of my friends, Natalie said, she was kind and said, um, you know, I think we should try to look at maybe doing some other stuff just in case for your future, like essentially trying to get me off the stage and yeah. into business. But so, exactly. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how it started. Um, and that's what I did when I was younger. I played and we had a, a record out and it was, I still have lots of copies if anybody wants oh, any. Hey, like there you go. Holding up a table or whatever you need it for. Um, but yeah, no, I think it was, it was integral in kind of understanding this thing and honestly i made a lot of contacts i still work with some of the agents and some of the people that i was begging for opening slots from now some of them have gone on to be big agents you know and and a lot of movers and shakers out there so um I, without that i don't know that any of this would have necessarily happened the way it did so i definitely well, think it was an important part of yeah, it's cool how that stuff kind of works out and that you you know you were able to actually see the side from the artist's sure. point of view too and kind of live that lifestyle so i think that probably gives you a little bit more empathy or at least understanding on, on what they're maybe thinking when you're booking shows and kind of how that works now. I mean, it, in addition to that, like, you know, watching guys like, you know, Randy or like the whole scene was kind of Randy-ish, Wade, like Radweed was kind of coming down. Yeah. And like, I wasn't really anywhere near what they were obviously doing. But like, it was interesting to see from the inside, whenever you start to get a little heat, and you start to get a little popularity and you're trying to, you know, you, you see, you just hear conversations and you see these guys talk. And it's like, it's, it was, that was an interesting part too, seeing like the backside of how that looks for people who are actually on the rise. For know? sure. So it was, it was just a neat, it was a neat time for sure. So we mentioned Coke FM, Randy Rogers, you know, Coke Fest, uh, uh, you're a part of Troubadour Fest, uh, Chili Fest, the, the list goes on, mm -hmm. uh, kind of getting into the industry and your experiences going from an artist to uh, actually now helping throw this, put these massive events on, is there any surprises or things that um, has kind of blown your mind about that festival music industry right now that has changed, like you said, since those early days with Randy Rogers? I think watching these guys take the jump from independent artists to, you know, management, structured management agents who are really, you know, efficient at what they do. Um, you know, the whole negotiation process is interesting, like the way that it works. And, you know, it's not just about money. And a lot of people just think it's like, oh, if I have this much money, I can just get this guy or this girl or whatever. And that's not reality. The reality is they they have gotten really good at creating looks and like they, they, they market themselves really well and they want to put themselves in a place where this is a good look for them from a lineup standpoint, from a you know, geographical standpoint from how can I, you know, use this to reach a certain audience. And these guys, with all, with all the metrics everyone has now from Spotify and different things, they know where the people are that like them. And sometimes they'll pass on a show because we just don't have a great following in the X market or whatever right. and we don't think. So it's it's been interesting. But it's great, though, because, I mean, and sometimes they're they're kind enough to share data with you and they can show you kind of like what, you know, it, it's it's been, that, that part's been very interesting and eye-opening because... Sure. Before, you just threw darts, you know? It's like, well, let's try it. we got to break this market somehow. Let's just keep going to, you know, whatever, College Station for six years, and hopefully somebody – it's like sometimes it doesn't work like that. Sometimes you got to go to your strengths, and then you can build a groundswell from that kind of thing. So, so that's been interesting for so sure. It's like, you know, Jim and I have not played in that world. The smallest thing that we've done is we brought in John Bauman uh, <laughs> at our Texas Independence Day Fest. Which did really well. Uh, it was awesome. Bauman's uh, awesome. Free event. Luckily, we did not have to sell tickets. Uh, it was just a way to bless our community and have a, a party here in Frisco. 
But it's interesting because it's when we invite him to come, is like how many people are going to come? We had no clue. Mm-hmm. From your perspective, when you're hosting or putting on an event and you're booking bands, being a business guy, I'm always like, it blows me away of like, how do you add or how do you understand the value of an artist? You kind of, you know, dabbled in it in that common moment ago with Spotify and things, but how are y'all like looking at an artist thinking, okay, they're worth this much, you know, $15,000, $50,000, and they're going to bring in X amount of people into our festival or event? Like, I don't know if you can share that, but what, is there a science or math equation of how y'all figure that out? I mean, top line, just because it's easier, it's, um, you know, there's a lot of numbers and metrics that you can mm-hmm. kind of pull down. It's not as much from the, you know, from our side, but it's, um, it's enough to where you can kind of get a handle. And honestly, I mean, you, you know, being in the space, you kind of start following a lot of venues and things closely because you kind of see whenever people are kind of running through, you can see how well they do at certain venues. And I mean, I'm always kind of scouring Instagram and stuff to see, you know, how they look. I find a picture from this night, this venue, yeah. this artist, see how they look, see how full it is. But I mean, we have, we have some systems like there's a, a, a it's a essentially a database called Polestar, which is um, kind of what a lot of folks use, but the reporting on that is kind of spotty. So you can only use it really as a data point, not the yeah. data point. So when you start putting these things together and honestly, like sometimes, you know, if you're, if you're attuned with management, if, if you can be, sometimes they'll share Spotify information with you and they'll kind of give you, or you can just watch streams and um, kind of see who's hitting a little bit. So there's, there's, I don't know, five, six, eight, ten data points you kind of put in there. But um, value wise, it's, it, it does help to have an idea of how many tickets that you think an artist will move um, just based on history, right? Like if there's any plays within 90 miles of where you are, if you can get some information on that, put it against how their Spotify numbers are, put it against, you start putting together these little, stories on how this would make sense and a lot of it's just projection because i mean some some shows that i've been a part of should have been huge or hits or at least sufficient to sell you know the amount of tickets that you expect but sometimes there's just you know there's no accounting for taste there's fickle crowds there's weather there's all kinds of stuff that come into play but yeah that's that's kind of what we use is it's really just numbers and data and like comps like year over year or um recent plays is really the best way to kind of get there. You always think it's fun to see an artist kind of in their early stages and they play a venue and then they come back like six months later and there's like the crowd's a little bit bigger and then they come back, you know, eight or nine months later after that and it's like sold out. So they've kind of built their their audience. You know, like Austin Mead, we've seen him play in front of, I've seen him play in front of like, you know, 50 people and then, you know, a few months ago he sold out Green Hall. So it's just like crazy things like that. And then Flatland, I saw them like at, Little Elm Beer and Beer Fest like four years ago, and you know it was a small little. No one was even coming up to say hi to him afterwards. So it's like no big deal. And then they opened up for like Luke Combs the other night at yeah. Cowboy Stadium. So it's no just doubt. like it's amazing to see some of the growth of these guys. And I guess yeah, keeping up those metrics and kind of following the trends and kind of seeing who's hitting and then who's bringing that crowd back. And it's pretty it's pretty fun to see, especially when you see people when they're starting out and build up so big. I've been fortunate to see several folk kind of take that path and it's been, it's, it's, it's great. It's, it's rewarding. I mean, not for me personally, it's just, re- it's rewarding that the scene has that to offer, I guess. Um, but yeah, you know, watching, I mean, watching Cody and then obviously watching Co. like I watched that, that's one of the more remarkable stories I've ever seen is that the way that his trajectory went and to where he is now. I mean, it's unbelievable, but you know, but to see them in these small rooms and like, you know, just, but the thing with him that was always interesting, and Cody for that matter, that was interesting, and Parker really, kind of in hindsight. But like the thing that's interesting is like their 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 crowds were always really engaged. They may not have been the biggest crowds, but you could tell they were already diehard into this whole thing. So the word just spread, and it was it was cool to watch that. But yeah, it's you know, but even some of the smaller artists, I like to see. You know, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm really a big big songwriter guy. That's really where a lot of like my passion comes from. Is like these kind of like troubadour type folks who are are really into that element of it. Um, but you know, seeing people come to town and, and continue to do well that are just really prolific songwriters makes me happy too. But even if the room's not super full, these again, these these people who come to see them are really engaged in this and they believe in them and they believe in their stories and so all that together, um, I don't know. That's but to your point, yeah, I do think it's cool. Yeah, I mean, I think when there's too. passion in any group of fans, it's it's probably something that maybe just someone hasn't discovered yet, and you just know that if there's this group of people that are that passionate. There's got to be a bigger swatch of people that would for sure, and it's there's you can see that that growth for sure. And then you can always do the 
I used to go see them when they were only. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, that's there, always whatever. fun. Yeah, I, I like. <laughs> I have a couple of those stories I like to tell. But so obviously you've put on some, or been a part of, or did put on some incredible events. Is, has there been a moment in your entire? And it could be when you were playing. It could be also putting on these events that you were sitting in a festival, a venue, and you looked around like, man, I helped put this on. Like an aha moment of, I helped do this. I mean, the first year of Coke Fest was, even though it was a little bit of a, of a, we missed the marks. Um, but fortunately, I mean, it was, it was on stage, Robert O'Keen, Turnpike, um, like Mike Ryan, Jason Bolin, Parker was way early in the day. Parker might've been the first one. It was either Bauman or Parker. Were the first Opened one. up at one thirty that afternoon. It was, right. <laughs> it was very early in the day. So the lineup was great. And honestly, the sound and production and all that stuff ran really well. We just had some infrastructure issues with the actual a venue but um but yeah to just have that culmination was really cool um but each year i feel like it gets better now that we have a lot more it's more optimized and it goes well um but yeah the you know sometimes we'll just take a minute and because we're all running around so sometimes we'll just take a minute and look out there and like see just people as far as you can see kind of and the show you know it just looks massive and you're just like wow this is this is a lot of work from a lot of people but it's cool just to kind of like say that we've 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 done it and so there's something there with a completion mm-hmm. kind of thing it's like yeah, okay sure. you just plan for a year and, and it all like, comes okay. together um but i will say like um one of the one of the funniest moments or not funniest just one of the most surreal moments was um like we had mark chestnut on the show a couple of years ago and mark chestnut was the first concert i ever saw at the houston rodeo when i was like 10 or something eight, wow. eight nine ten I somewhere, somewhere in that my grandpa took me to see him and it was like he was at the, was at the astrodome like it was it was this the big deal you know and um, it's just kind of funny. So I'm walking up like a merch check to him from settling the merch at the booth. And I'm handing like his, he's on there. I can see him. And it's like, this is just a very weird moment that, you know, we went from that to like, here's here's your settlement check and whatnot. Thanks for playing my show or, or our show. You know, That's it's, really cool. It's kind of just a weird, it sounds random. It's a small right. memory, but it was just kind of like this full, circle. full circle there. So no right. doubt. I think we all know the the industry that we're all in is uh, definitely a people-driven business and uh one example i have is uh, i was sitting in mckinney uh, melody of hope it's an organization that i'm a part of and they're hosting an event in mckinney and they had Django walker playing and y- you were going to come up and you're walking up from the parking lot and Django from the stage was like hey mark <laughs> and it was kind of a moment i realized like man these, everyone knows who you are in that industry or at least from my perspective um for you, how has, as you do these festivals, work with bands, uh, you mentioned lease and so on, uh, how do you, I'm assuming it's very much an industry that's about who you know uh, can drive the success of, of what you're doing, is how do you build your relationships, then grow your relationships, and then maintain those relationships so that you can keep on you know, bringing these bands and management sponsors back to all the festivals year after year? Um appreciate you saying that i don't know everybody i don't think everybody knows me but i try to keep my network as wide as possible but um yeah you know it's it's i've done business pretty much the same way um since i started because i've been in sales you know for a long time and and um you know the the, like always under promise and over deliver kind of thing is what i really try to stick to as much as possible because at the same time you know you have to you have to have transparency and trust in relationships no matter what they are right so it's it's i try to do it the same way like i don't you know step over a, a dime to make a nickel or whatever the saying is it's like i'd rather do things the correct way and people start to trust you after a period of time whenever you do it you know in, in succession so um yeah it, it is a small there's a lot of us that kind of ran together early who are all kind of like in our careers well in our careers now so there's a lot of that network that, that exists right. meeting the, the younger guys is always kind of tricky because you know it's i am a little older than them now so it's not as easy to kind of make these friendships and, and relationships with the younger guys but fortunately a lot of their management and agents and whatnot are all you know people that i, I either know or come in contact with or have you know some sort of past history with um but yeah there's and honestly it's kind of an interesting dichotomy in the fact that there there are a ton of artists but frankly there's you know, a handful of agents who handle most of them and whether they're a regional agent, which is essentially they'll handle Texas. So at a, at a big agency, they may have one person who kind of handles fairs and festivals in Texas. So I deal with one agent and then 
they may have 20 or 30 bands that all kind of route through Texas. So that it becomes really tight because there's just a handful of people that you really kind of work with on a daily basis from, from that side. Um, but like, you know, sponsor side, same thing. It's like, I have a lot of, I have a lot of sponsors. I'm always looking for new ones, but I have a lot of sponsors who I've had for since I've started, you know, I have, I have some of the same clients that I started with in radio 20 years ago, some of wow. the same people. So, um, but yeah, and honestly, I'll, I'll, you guys know me. I'm always there. I'm always on site. I'm always like, I, I like to make sure personally that things are done correctly, not to like micromanage, but I just want to make sure that if my name's on it, it's, it's done appropriately. Um, so that I think also builds trust over time and that's how you get referrals and things because they know I'm not going to drop the ball for the most part. Like right. I, I try to keep things and get the follow through. Um, but yeah, and I don't know. I think relationships are by far the most important thing that you can kind of cultivate, not only on business, but just in general. But cause I mean, you and I we're friends and like that's, but that was built through sort of a pseudo business relationship at first, but that's, that's how I prefer to do things like, you know, right. as much as possible. Um, but yeah, I think that's, you know, I've never been like a, like a, a really like wink and nod kind of salesperson. I've always been like, let's, let's figure out some solutions here. How can we create a win for everybody and then let's you know talk about how your kids are and whatnot and let's see if we can strike up a friendship too and that's that's how my referral network has worked because people put me in that for sure perspective so that's fun well all this business talk is pretty exciting but <laughs> i want to get to some of the nitty-gritty let's go backstage let's figure out what's going on um i'm gonna <laughs> rapid true. fire a few questions here and kind of uh see what you think i think this is what the people really want to hear i think so um, I think you're gonna be who's the biggest pre Madonna in the industry? I'm just kidding. I won't make you answer that. <laughs> um, let's talk about backstage. I'll, though. Say, I'll say Elise. We'll start there. Let's let's talk about um, backstage first. You know, people like, man, it must be wild backstage. You know what's going on. Tell the truth about backstage. I mean, there's probably some you know depending on who it is and stuff. But I mean, what's really going on backstage? And then also, have there been, ever been like any writers or anything that, that you kind of felt like they were ridiculous or kind of what are some of the standards with that? The most bands ex- want the most exciting thing about backstage is that there are air conditioned bathrooms and typically free drinks. That's <laughs> right. pretty much the right. epitome of what backstage is. Maybe a little, you know, a couple extra breakfast tacos or whatever. It's really, I mean, a lot of these guys, you know, the, the bands that we run with, most of them have at a minimum some kind of like sprinter van, which is typically air conditioned and a lot of times diesel, so they'll run it all day or buses. And you don't see a lot of. I mean, sometimes the band members will kind of climb off and hang out and go get some food and walk around because we do have some stuff at most of our festivals, like some, you know, hospitality stuff. So they'll just kind of hang out, maybe go watch some of the show. But it's nothing really like what people think. I mean, this is not like, you know, Guns N' Roses back there. Right. Like, it's not like one of these things. And frankly, it's actually interesting because, you know, whenever people shifted from um, having like monitors on the stage where you like, hear themselves back so that, they, they, you know, they'd put them on the stage and speakers would go back at the band and that's how they heard themselves and how they sounded – They've all gone to these in-ear monitors to where they, they're they essentially like, you know, they're all, it's all self-contained inside. It's quiet backstage too. Like right. you can, you can talk, we could talk like this right next to the stage for sure with no problem. And it's just, it's so backstage is just not quite as, as sexy as what everybody thinks, but I mean, it's fun. It's, it's nice. There's a lot of room, but it's not, I mean, we've seen some stuff go down. Like, don't get me wrong. There's a couple of funny stories of specific people that are, are funny and, and whatnot, but it's not. It's 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 less of the of the norm than it is the exception. So right. Yeah, I think we found that out too. I mean, we we were lucky enough to get backstage for a couple of like the Coke Fest and things. But yeah, there's it's, it's not really much going on back there. I mean, most people that you have their big they have their big buses and stuff, and they just hang out on there, and then they'll come out right before showtime, and then when the show's over, they usually get right back on their bus. And now, what goes on on the buses? Yeah, is entertaining. Right. But we're not really. That's not really part of what we're hip to. So. Yeah, gotcha. But um. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely a little more mellow than I think most people would ever imagine. So, yeah, um, boring. Like, what about writers or anything? Is there anything that they want? Like, there's certain, you know, things that you've had to do for bands to get them ready that they have to have before they can play or feel that they can play. You know, different events have different scenarios. Some events are more like Coke Fest. We try to we try to make sure that we take care of everything they're looking for. Um, but some of these, you know, we get these these artists who are starting to get a little bit bigger, and it's not. I mean, it's not completely out of the ordinary or unreasonable it's just different so there's a lot more it's a lot more little things that are like not we're not used to necessarily Mm because we're a festival so like you know glass plates just 
different little oh, things that we're not used to, you know. Glass plates. Um, just little tiny things, but you know, we we've had some. We've had previously. We've had some some uh, scenarios where you know we've had a lot of stuff that was asked for, and you know, different types of diets and things, and then not even necessarily used after all the effort was. So it's like, ah, you know, so right. there's a little bit, but it's you know, it's part of the game, man. You got to pay to play. So oh it's, yeah, we just kind of right. take it in stride because that's what you got to do. I, I used to work at. Uh, uh, at an organization in Lubbock, but we we're help. I was helping support an event at United Spirit Arena on Texas Tech campus, mm-hmm. and there was a very, very big musician that came in, a female uh, pop, pop, you know, top one hundred artist. And in her rider, one of the elements was a pink couch, okay, and a pink rug. And so when when she arrived, they actually had someone come in and monitor that to make sure like everything was to the T of the rider. Everything was fine, and they came in, and everything was great. But that was my first time I ever saw something like that. I had no clue. Uh, but that's not Texas country Americana. That was, again, a top 100-level writer drama diva thing, you know. So There are little things like that, but it's, you know, eccentricities kind of thing. And I don't like I said, some festivals are different. Um, some of ours, we kind of cater more to that, and some of them are a little um, – fast and loose so it just depends on which one we're at at the moment but. so who are some of the artists that you really enjoyed working with over the years that you you're just like you know another thing talking about backstage these guys that have kind of made it they've learned to most of them have learned to become a professional mm-hmm. they're like hey i can't party like crazy like i used to in college and come out here and, and put on a good show True. and i and i'm gonna have to do another show tomorrow night so i can't get crazy wild after the show either so that, that i think a lot of them have kind of grown up and say hey I'm making a lot of money from this, mm-hmm. doing something that I love. I need to take care of my body. I need to take care of my voice and that kind of stuff. So I think that that yeah. probably plays a lot into it. But, like, what are some of the the artists that you've seen kind of really grow and, and that you enjoy uh, working with that you feel are, like, kind of really true professionals in the field? Um, you know, it's it's interesting you say that because a lot of times you'll see them. Um, it's when the bands get really serious, too, um, and, and, and you can tell when they go to the next level. Like, you can see bands who are just kind of, throwing it out there and then you see bands who are like you can tell spend time on it um and get really tight and then that's that's kind of when they a lot of times take a next step is when right. they get to the point where i mean they are locked essentially like a lot of them run metronomes but like they they seem like human metronomes because everything's just so in the pocket and tight but um you know i mean watching you know i keep harping on the same people but um you know, watching watching Cody, those guys take it very, very, very seriously and have for a long time. Cause I, it's almost like they knew immediately that they were going to be on that level. So, um, but theoretically, they've been great. Cody and those guys have stepped up. They've got some different musicians and and some different things they've worked on, and it's been impressive to watch them. Parker has has a whole new like lease on life. Like it's it's um, that that being taken over and kind of working with management teams, you can tell he's really polished his show. Like I saw him at Dos Equis last year and like, it's just, it's a, it's a show. Like, right. It's, yeah. How was that? Same thing with, oh, okay. There you go. So same, same awesome. thing with Cody, like all these guys I and mean, they're playing, I guess whenever you, you know, it's like, and it's weird because like, it's not overnight. Clearly these guys have been doing it for a long time, but like the step from playing like, you know, a club show to going to play the Houston rodeo, like you have to have, like you can't, there's not a lot of room for error on these mm-hmm. things. So they understand that. And, um, you know, and, these guys playing late night shows and just different stuff. I mean, like Hayes Carl, I watched the other day was on, um, like it was a rerun, but like these guys are, everyone has to have some level of, of, of professional, um, ability because there's, there's just people have more opportunity to be, um, on display. So I think, I think you see a lot of people focusing and kind of getting more serious early on. And even some of these young bands, like, I follow a lot of these young guys too, and I think we were just talking about a band called Tritty Oak Revival, and these guys are starting to move tickets really consistently. And you know, but I saw them; they were there last year at Chili Fest, and you know, they're just kind of coming in on their van and kind of you know. But you can tell that they're seeing a swell, and they're starting to get tight and more serious. And it just happens. I think it's once they see some success and it's like, hey, we can do this. They kind of get more right. serious about and that's, it. That's I just now thought of this, but I mean, is there kind of like older bands kind of mentor younger bands or are they sometimes are they just out on their own or is it more up to like the younger band to kind of look up to a, a, a more established band and kind of like maybe reach out and say hey how are y'all doing this and is and is everybody in the industry kind of open to helping each other out sometimes. for the most part i mean i say for the most part yeah i mean you do see some bands like kind of you'll see people kind of going together um whether it's just like when you're friends with somebody like shared interest and whatnot or maybe their guitar players met or you know it's like there's always these little things but 
Um, and a lot of times band members are just friends with other band members, you know, so it's singers and singers or, you know, you just kind of start to, to, to vibe with each other. But, um, yeah, you know, you see some specific examples of where people work to create these relationships and bring in people and fold them under their wing and take them. And, and you'll see, you see, especially with, with artists who become more established, um, you know, they see someone they like and they want them to open for them often. So they'll, these guys, they, they either mesh like stylistically or just friends or whatever. So you'll see a lot of runs with guys who are consistent. Like one headliner will bring on an opener more often than not. So that's, there is, there is a lot of that, but that's, I feel like that's just human nature to kind of glom onto the people that you enjoy. Yeah. So, so a, a new band, a new musician, tr- uh, trying to get into the industry, trying to make it, maybe they're just playing small little local bars uh, you being on the business side, do you have a recommendation or a piece of advi- advice for a musician on maybe next steps of how to be seen or uh, try to enter into that festival, you know, grow into the industry? Man, that's a, I, I wasn't successful at it, so yeah. clearly I don't really have much <laughs> business giving advice. But, um, yeah, you know, it's it's a, it's such a interesting world like with the fragmentation and the way that people kind of consume content now um i would suggest having good content and slick and sounds good and like you want people to like people will want to listen to it so writing is really clearly very important and trying to get that portion of your life going um but i would just say play as many shows and meet as many people as you possibly can because you never know when that next person around you might break and then you can be under their wing with them or right. um or maybe you break and you take somebody with you but yeah i would I mean, we used to have like a, essentially like a commune is the wrong word, but like we used to have like a, you know, in San Marcos, there was a whole group of people who just run around together and, you know, play shows. And then we just wrote together and we were all friends. And it was like, it, it's that, I mean, so one of my buddies, I don't know, you guys know Ben Danaher, but like he's mm-hmm. still writing and he's still in Nashville. And it's like, you know, it's, it's some of these guys and he's super, you know, talented in so many ways. Sure. It's like there were some people that came out of that, that, that San Marcos scene and that New Braunfels scene at the time that, you know, but without that network and, and that, you know, friendship and meeting people and spending time together, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. You don't know. Had there not been a, a unified front of people trying to make things happen, you know, some of those guys might not have ever kept going or changed their, their career path or whatever, but they, they believed in what we were doing at the time. So I would just say like, you know, you keep, I get a lot of like EPKs and things like that right now for, um, you know, from bands who want to play the shows. And I try to, I generally try to respond to their, all of them just to say like, Hey, you know, either this sounds great, you know, whatever. And, um, but that's, that's, if you find out who the promoter is and you want to get on a festival, I would say, you know, it doesn't always work, but you can always try that. But playing the local clubs, getting, getting club owners to start to follow you and the club owners, a lot of times will be able to have a little more stroke and give you some recommendations and things. So very cool. I guess grinding is basically what I'm suggesting for sure. here. That's, so yeah, that's basically what you got to do with a lot of that stuff. And then you were talking about like your little group in San Marcos. I mean, I, I know Lubbock. You know, we both went to Tech, so the yeah, Lubbock music sure. scene. I mean, that whole crew with with Cleto and Dalton and Randall King and William Clark Green. I mean, they've all kind of. I, I know for a while there, they were all getting together and kind of doing like songwriting weekends and stuff. And so it's just really cool to see kind of that collaboration and kind of. I'll right. scratch your back, you scratch mine, we'll kind of help each other out. Hey, you can open for me if we get bigger, you know, that kind of sure. stuff. It's really yeah. fun to... Yeah, Pat and Corey were the probably original example. Yeah, they were thing They were there when I was know. there. That tells you my age, but... <laughs> I thought it was pretty cool. We were, I saw you at Hanks and McKinney, mm-hmm. uh, William Clark Green playing, and I saw some of the Josh Abbott band up on, on the backstage just mm-hmm. there to support them. Yeah, you for know, sure. The relationships, it's, it all goes back to people. You know, take care of people, and people hopefully take care of you. Yeah, you know the what's the saying? The rising tide raises all boats, kind of thing. Sure. So that's kind of I think that helps the scene a lot. And you know, like like Flatland being on a on a Luke Combs show, like that's I don't know that that would have happened twenty years ago. Like it's it's the way that that some of these management companies are taking you know notice of Texas folks and start to kind of bring them. And then you see some of this overlap now. And you know, Cody Johnson is is huge, and Parker's these guys are all on the ACMs and. And Giovanni in the Higher Guns last night. I don't know if you saw the iHeart Awards. Did you guys see this? I, I think Brandon saw it. He yeah. tweeted something out about it. Unbelievable. They won Best New Alt Rock, I think. And I was like, this is amazing. That's like, awesome. These guys are, you know, these are Texas guys. And they, they played in our scene still. I mean, exactly. they're on Chili Fest this weekend with me. Yeah. So it's like, it's just crazy. They just won this big award. So That's it's cool. It's neat so to see cool. it all out there. So 100%. Yeah. All right. Before we wrap up here, let's talk about venues. What are some of your favorite venues in Texas to host shows or 
go to. Or maybe a dream venue. Um, I mean, it's tricky on the dream venue side. I mean, I don't know because I feel like we build a lot of our venues. But like, yeah. if I just could like do a show somewhere, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I uh, I haven't been to enough venues. I feel like to really know which one I wanna I wanna do. But um, no, I mean, you know, I spend. Um, I like Saxon Pub in Austin quite a bit. I go there and and when I'm in town, typically to check out. There's usually somebody I want to see there of some sort. So I I just like it because it's just so dark inside. It's like it just feels like a throwback to something. Yeah, right. Um, I go to Hanks quite a bit. I spend a lot of time there just because it's so close to me. And and they have, he does a good job of running through a lot of uh, up and coming bands and stuff. So it's kind of cool to see those guys to your earlier point about how they kind of grow this following. So on Thursday, they might have this many and they kind of move to a Friday. So it's fun to watch that kind of thing and kind of get an idea of who's coming around. Um, Let me think here. I like Blue Light in Lubbock quite a bit. I spent a lot of time there when I started doing shows in Lubbock, and, and I just like, I don't know, I just like that room quite a bit. Um, the best sounding room, I think, is probably, there's a couple, but, like, one of them that's really good is is 310 in Austin. I don't know if you guys have been there. It's underneath mm-hmm. ACL or underneath the Moody where they do, like, the, oh, the nice. things. But it's the same people, and um, it's small rooms, like, less than 400 people, I think, but it's just, like, one of the better sounding rooms that in, in, in the state, I feel like. Um I don't know. That's I wish I had more off the top of my head. I didn't. Of course, I'm a New Braunfels one. boy, so we used to always hit up Green Hall a lot. Of course, I mean that's kind of the institution. The institution, but I mean, as far as like the acoustics and all that stuff, it's not probably all that great. But it's just the vibe that's in there. It's always fun. I got to play Green Hall one time, and it was with Django actually. It's really, funny, funnily oh, enough, yeah, awesome. he let me open for him. So talk about bringing people up. <laughs> Jeez, he let me, awesome. he let played me Green open Hall. For You're him. like a celeb in here. No, no, it was favor i think more than anything but i get to do it so it was cool but yeah that's the only time i've ever played there yeah well looking ahead you got anything cool coming on coming down the pipeline this year festivals events um anything that you want to the share of uh to let people know about so we have um chili fest is is this weekend um so that's that's going on. That's exciting. We're excited. It's it's Whiskey Myers on Friday with uh, Shane Smith, and we have a lot of cool bands that I really like, like Muscadine Bloodline is going to be on there, and then um, Geo's on there, and some of these guys. So I'm excited to see how that goes this That'll weekend. Be a but, good show. Yeah. Um, and then we have Coke Fest, which I can actually talk about. Um, so Coke Fest, we'll we're announcing, and um, you'll see it out there very shortly. Um, but it's going to be. Friday's Whiskey Myers, um, and we always like to bring a 90s country guy, 80s, 90s country. So we have Sammy Kershaw this year, which we haven't had yet. No. Um, and then we have uh, Will Green, William Clark Green's in the middle, and oh, then Caitlin Butts is on it. And then we have a band called The Weathered Souls um, who come around with uh, with whiskey quite a bit. Um, and then Saturday we have John Party, Riley Green. So we're going a little bit more of that kind of little Nashville, but also overlaps. I feel like yeah. those guys are really a good representation of what – um, could overlap with Texas really well. Um, so those two. And then um, we have Colby Cooper, Fowler. Kevin Fowler's going to nice. be back on it. Um, Treaty Oak Revival, like we said. And um, Jacob Stelly, out of, out of College Station. And oh, yeah. then we have Juliana Rankin, who she was at um, she was at Steamboat this year, and people just fell in love with her. And, and we had Coke guys from Coke, Eric Rains from Coke, came back and was just raving and raving. So we – Got in touch with her, and we're going to bring her on for our, our opener on Fun. on Saturday. So, yeah, awesome. excited. That'll be a good one. And, of course, we have the Troubadours in May, and then we have one in October. So, man, Troubadour in College Station in May, and then Troubadour in Salina. I'll say you fall. you and your group uh, is one of the highlights to our team's uh, year. As, you know, Tom, we text us. We love not only popping up, selling some shirts, but being a part of it uh, and also listening to great music. And it's uh, always a great time. Good yeah. deal. Fun weekends for sure. So, well, I was going to give you a little shout out. One thing, uh, you know, Lise uh, from over there at uh, Coke FM always uh, speaks highly of you with what you do. Um, from our relationship with you as uh, as sponsors to some of your events, uh, you always put on a high, you know, t- uh, excellence, uh, you know, top notch uh, hospitality. Uh, we really thank you. Do a fantastic job of what you do. So kudos to you for for all that. the success that you've helped create. And if if I was in your spot, one of the coolest things for me would be like how many people you've uh, helped support having a great time. I and mean, think about <laughs> people's memories in life. How many people might say your events was some of their best memories in life? And that's a pretty cool deal. Never thought about that, but that's so 
I, I do enjoy a good time. So yeah. that, that goes right in line with my mantra. So. Yeah. yeah, just that look at that picture of me last year at the Turnpike Show <laughs> at uh, Coke Fest. That pretty much sums it up. That was freaking awesome. I was like in the in the moment. For uh, you, top ten tumbleweed textiles memories. You probably have five or six of those. Yeah. All yeah. right, I like it. Yeah, it was good stuff. So anyway. I guess we're going to wrap it up. Mark, thanks for joining us today. We thanks. appreciate it. That appreciate was, that was a really good uh, conversation, and I think a lot of people are going to enjoy hearing what you have to say about the music industry. No so. doubt. Good deal. You guys have a great afternoon, and we will see you later. <laughs>